Hello everybody, my name is Ratnos, and in this video we've got a plus 20 Mechagon workshop shrouded uh, on the first week's affixes. This was tyrannical, quaking inspiring, which will soon not be the affixes, it is still as the time of this video coming out, but not for long. Uh, but I want to take a look at workshop, because actually quite a bit in this dungeon has changed since it was Awakened Season. They've actually changed, I feel like they've changed the damage numbers on a lot of these mechanics, so if you're used to the BFA version of this dungeon, there's actually quite a bit different here. So first pull with Inspiring, you're going to have these detonates going off. You do need to stop that probably a couple key levels above that. You can see the damage is quite high when those happen, and if two were to happen at the same time, it would be quite bad here. Uh, but with Inspiring, that's kind of annoying to do, so we're just healing through it on this difficulty, but if the key level were to go up a little bit, that would not be doable. The Hammer here is still quite good for killing these this trash. Um, so... You can actually use the hammer, not by getting stunned by it yourself. I'm demonstrating there what not to do, but you just get the mobs under it and you get out and uh, hit them with it. If you have multiple people standing under the hammer at the same time to, to start that swirly, uh, then it will actually do more damage as well, which is uh, pretty good. You can prime the hammers by going under them, uh, getting one swirly, and then once you get the one swirly, everybody else can go in under it afterwards. But that's no longer something even really worth doing on the boss fight. It seems like the hammers are doing basically no damage to the bosses. The only thing they're really useful for is you still need to use them to take the plating off of the Platinum Pummeler. Uh, but they don't seem to... They, it used to be you could kill the, the Tonk really quick by just smashing it with the hammer. But it does like half a percent of its health or something every time it comes down. So I'm not even sure it's really worth worrying about anymore. Your DPS should be focused on killing the Tonk here. And your tank can move the uh, other one around. You need to make sure you're not in front of the vent jets or you'll get killed or to the sides of the, the thing. The melee can still hit from behind the, uh, the tonk there, but everybody else needs to make sure that they are not getting hit by it as it's going in front. Like, don't, don't be in front of the tonk during that. Don't be near the pummeler during Whirling Edge. That'll do a lot of damage as well. Uh, and yeah, don't worry about damaging the pummeler even once it's gotten its stacks removed. Uh, you can bring them together to cleave, but the tank is still the one that does the big group damage. Every time it does vent jets, it hits the whole party for a lot of damage. So, yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Here's Again, here's what the, the hammer's going to do here. 50 points, yeah, it does uh, just 1% of the, the tank's health, so not hugely important. Maybe it's still worth if you can get all five people to bait it, uh, but I'm not sure that the hammers are... They're definitely not what they used to be in terms of just smashing these, uh, these bosses. Um... Or maybe it's just I feel that way because we're not having we're not having five people bait them as I was talking about to get five copies of the the hit. Um, so yeah, that's this boss, and then you just DPS it down. You can the tank does have a threat table, and it will always charge at whoever has threat, and it'll also always do the foe flipper on whoever has threat. So the tank can taunt it and uh, keep it aimed at a wall and and get flipped uh, by it. And uh, then the Vent Jets do does not target the threat target or anything. I think it targets non-tanks as well. So uh, that's how the this fight works. You can see we've done a little bit of kind of even cleave between these two. Um, I think that's normal. Let's wait until I next target the Platinum Pummeler so we can see how much health it has. Because I feel like it has less health than the, the Tonk. Yeah, it does. It has half as much health as the Tonk. So even if you're kind of focusing on the Tonk, when the two of them are together, the Platinum Pummeler will die pretty quick. Uh, but the Tonk still is the, the one that needs to die because it's the one that does the unavoidable group damage. And especially on higher keys, that's going to start to be a problem for you. On lower keys, yeah, you can, again, just even cleave efficiently. Totally a fine thing to do. After this, we go to the next trash section. I am increasingly becoming a fan of using your, like, one skip in this dungeon here rather than at the end of the dungeon. You, the Historically, you would always skip the pack at the end of the dungeon, but that was because you could awaken skip it. Without Awakened, you need something like a Warlock and and also something else like a Mind Sooth to be able to make that skip really good without using something like a Battle Res. So instead, here's the thing that I was trying out in this run that I actually kind of like and uh, and maybe recommend going forward. I've still I've got to do more practice run or more runs of this dungeon to really be sure. But it feels like that end pack of the dungeon is actually not that bad. We'll talk about it when we get to it. Uh, and it feels like the trash here is actually pretty toxic especially with how you can't see anything and in, in all the water that's under stuff uh so especially with these infiltrators fighting them down there you know the the clouds are like completely invisible uh and so i've become a fan of i still think doing this first infiltrator it just makes sense because like that's that's it's so early in the dungeon you're gonna have those stats for the rest of the dungeon uh i don't think the pull is too bad to fight that by itself uh, but then after this i used shroud 
We skip this next waste processing unit as well as that pack of slimes with the in, uh, inspiring in it. Uh, and we can skip past all of this and we go, go straight to the mini boss, which is right over here. You can walk around this mini boss even without shroud if you kill everything else. If you if you don't like fighting the mini boss, you could literally just hold the side of the wall and not pull the mini boss uh, and pull everything else here. That's definitely a fine thing to do. But instead, what we're doing here is we are killing the mini boss. We're getting those stats for these tyrannical bosses in this dungeon. Uh, you know, tyrannical mechagon, tyrannical machinist garden. Really good boss fights to have some extra stats for. Uh, Zolgamux does take at ages to kill. Ideally, you want Wound Poison from your Rogue, which it does look like our Rogue has on this to help it heal less. Uh, we've also got a Warrior, although the Warrior's playing Fury in this dungeon, not Arms, so no Mortal Strikes uh, will be forthcoming there. Uh, and so, yeah, using those kind of effects to reduce the size of the healing uh, is a nice thing to do. And then just fighting Zolgamux on some nice flat terrain where you can see the Shadow Eruption with no mobs nearby, nothing that can accidentally pull. Uh, and it doesn't take too long uh, as you start getting to higher keys, it starts taking kind of increasingly longer because, like, the shield is getting bigger and it's healing for more and it has more base health. And so all of those kind of multiply together. And in the high keys, you have to really start, like, sending cooldowns if you want to get this thing killed. Uh, but here on the plus 20 this week, it's like, it's not too bad. And you do get three stacks of the the shrouded buff, which, again, that's, that's like 6% haste uh, for me. And so if that's on the whole party, 6% haste, like, that's a fifth of a bloodlust for the rest of the dungeon that you're getting out of this uh, for, you know, full uptime as well. I think it may still be worth it. It definitely doesn't feel worth it to kill this thing, especially whenever it does this blood siphon at 1% uh, nonsense. Uh, but even though it feels really bad to play, I think it might still be worth it, but I'm not sure. It, this might just be a mob that you start skipping in every dungeon. Well, I, the jury is still out for me. After this, come back and grab a little bit more trash, uh, but we can pull it over here towards this pillar, a nice easy line of sight one uh, that is available. Uh, there's another pillar over to the other side as well that you can use, and uh, we get a shrouded mob in here, as well as a waste processing unit and a bunch of the a bunch of the waste. Um, I actually don't... I, I need to look at MDT and see how much of this we actually needed for count. I was kind of being... I pulled a little bit more than I think we probably needed, but we'll see when we get to the end of the dungeon how much over count we do. Uh, and then, yeah, here's just an infiltrator, a dog, and a waste processing unit. Let's get ahead to Cujo, because Cujo we got a lot to talk about on. Uh, so Cujo is actually one of the bosses that has the most stuff going on in this dungeon, especially for tanks. So a few things you need to do with this boss. One thing that you can actually do that's really powerful, this Blazing Chomp timer you can see. Blazing Chomp is a dot that like murders your tank and AoEs the group when it's dispelled. But if you just AMS right before it is coming out, you don't get Blazing Chomped. So if you're playing a Blood Decay, you can AMS that. I think you can reflect it if you're a warrior as well. Uh, and if you just do that off cooldown, that'll be nice. Now what I've done here with this Venting Flames is not good because I don't have the boss close enough for melee to hit during this. The way this works is that if you have, you can see I, I'm safe here. I have this weak aura that's letting me know I'm safe. You get a buff whenever you are safe from the venting flames behind a box. Uh, and so what you can do is you can actually fight the boss on the corner of the box. And there will generally be a safe spot that still has line of sight and melee range to the boss. So I'm going to try and set that up now. You can see the boss right kind of on this corner uh, towards the long edge. We spread for the quaking and I'm f fishing for it. And here I've found a spot that is by the corner of this box, but it counts as safe. I'm getting that safe buff. You can see the buff in my buff bar. You can see the weak aura telling me I'm safe. And we're all able to continue to do damage to Cujo uh, during the venting flames. So that's a nice little bit of optimization you can do as a tank there. Uh, the other thing that you can do on this fight is the understand how the leap works. So the explosive leap will target players, and then it will always leap at the farthest target each time. So if you've got three people, right, it'll leap at the farthest person, and then it'll leap at the next, it'll look again at everybody and leap again at the next far, farthest away person. Uh, and it will just keep doing that until it's done with targets. But if it chooses somebody like a rogue or a hunter, they can vanish or feign, and it will stop doing its whole thing. If you vanish or feign while the leap is coming at you, while it's midair, it will just land on top of you, not actually do any damage, and then cancel the whole rest of the ability. So that's really valuable if you can do it. You can see Brand going over there, doing it now. Runs over, is the farthest away person, so he knows it's going to jump at him first, uh, and then cast his vanish. 
Now here we actually have two boxes that are right on top of each other. So you gotta be really careful. Whenever you're near another box that's already red, it will explode and knock back an AOE. So we had to move a little bit away from that to make sure that didn't happen. Ideally, you want to prevent the boxes from spawning on top of each other by moving away from the old boxes. Uh, you can see our Shadow Priest is not doing that here, so if they are targeted by the airdrop, uh, it would be bad. Luckily, it targeted the Druid instead for where the next uh, next box was going to be dropped, uh, and so that was safe as well. You also have to be really careful to not move your Explosive Leap near the boxes as well, because that will also superheat them uh, and get you in trouble. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's the Cujo fight. Again, one of the most complicated fights in the... Uh, in terms of, like, all the little nitpicks you can do with it. But if you just do it... If you just make sure to not explode an extra box and uh, not, like, cleave people with the leap, you're going to be fine. But on high key, you do want to start doing all that stuff that I mentioned in that video. Or, I guess, in this video. Uh, so, yeah, you can Venthyr up. You can Warlock Gate up along this part. Uh, if you're playing a DK... You actually can Death's Advance here, and you won't get pushed back by the Conveyor Belt. I don't know why I didn't choose to do that. That was foolish. Uh, I think there's even a Goblin Jump I've heard of as well. I, I wasn't confident enough to know where it was or what it looked like, but at some point if I see somebody do that, I will, in a future Mechagon Workshop video, show everybody uh, how exactly to do a Goblin Jump to, to save time in that area. But yeah, otherwise, you just kind of run up here. Uh, and here we have the a little trash set of trash waves uh, that are going to come out. Uh, so you don't have to actually pull all these citizens. The citizens will just go away if you pull the alarm robot, but uh, they don't really do anything. So as long as it's not necrotic week or whatever, you can just pull them and get some extra AOE uh, if you want. Here we have the first spawn. I'm going to mass grip and get everything grouped together here. Uh, you have two of the dogs and two of these casters that chain cast Giga Wallop. It's good to interrupt that. Uh, and they also make these squirrels. And the squirrels run out and you want to move out of that swirly. It's a lot of damage. If you have a priest, they can mind control these tinkerers and send the squirrels at the enemies, and that does a boatload of damage. So priests should be doing that. I don't think our priests are doing that here because uh, playing shadow and shadow priests, you know, you'll, they'll never cast mind control. They just want to do their shadow stuff. But healing priests, you can usually make do that. And shadow priests, I think, actually probably should do it too, uh, of emceeing the the casters and sending in some squirrels uh, to be on your side instead. That speeds this area up and future areas. Uh, after that wave, we get a set of three robots. Two of them spawn here where I am. One of them spawns far away. So uh, in order to get initial threat, just use a blood boil on the close ones, taunt the far one, and uh, get them all grouped up over here nice and easy. We do have inspired here, so all of these casts are going to go off, uh, except for from the mob that is actually inspiring itself. These short outs are going to go off. But if you remember from BFA, short out did a lot of damage. It looks like that damage is dramatically nerfed uh, compared to the BFA versions, or at least it feels that way. Because, uh, yeah, that used to be really, really lethal. Even on, like, a low key, uh, you would feel it. And if you watch our health bars here, maybe it's just because Restor Druid Hots are counteracting it really well, but it feels like it's not nearly as bad as it was in that expansion. After this, you get a, uh, a spider thing. You can actually move this spider to the corner of the room if you have a lot of range in your group. And then, so, like, if you move it down to the bottom right here and the range can stand up here, they can outrange it, and they can actually outrange the capacitor discharge. So that's a nice thing that they can uh, they can do, that you can do for them. If you have melee in your group, by contrast, especially on Quaking Week, you may want to leave it in the middle of the room. So I've decided to leave it in the middle of the room, uh, despite the fact that that's led to our clueless Shadow Priest getting silenced, because I forgot how the mechanic worked of uh, needing to move to the safe slice. But yeah, on Quaking Weeks, I would recommend actually keeping it in the middle if you have two or more melee, because... Otherwise, you'll kind of be, you'll get in these spots where the safe spot is double quaked or triple quaked. Uh, but otherwise, moving it to the corner and having the ranged able to outrange and not have to move is a good idea. This is the stealth gauntlet, uh, where you got to be careful to not run through the circles. There is a dreadlord here. If you're going to pull this dreadlord, you got to be careful because you do not want a sleepy cloud or a frontal in the vents. So what we do here is we actually wait until the first sleepy cloud comes out. And then we can start moving safely along to the next vent. Uh, and very close. Three times here I've come very close to disaster in terms of getting MC'd. Or getting uh, stunned and sent back. But, you know, it didn't happen. Didn't matter. It's all fine. Uh, and we, we keep on fighting this infiltrator. And moving on up into the next safe vent. One of our brave members of the group got sent back to the start. Uh, but 
we got four people here. That's enough to keep this pull going. And we go into this next one. I think it's probably going to not be worth it to pull that Infiltrator unless maybe you get through the gauntlet and then you, you tag it and you bring it with you forward. But probably don't want to actually just like chain pull it through the gauntlet like that. That seemed pretty sketchy. So uh, I don't think I recommend that. Uh, but then, yeah, coming into this pull, this pull, the thing to know is the generator is a safe spot that will reduce your damage taken by a huge amount, but it also reduces the enemy's damage taken if they are standing in it. So uh, ideally, you want to move the mobs out of the generator, and then the group can stand in the generator. That's complicated by the fact that Sleepy Puddles will be filling the generator up uh, with the Shrouded Affix, so... You know, do be careful of that. You don't need to stand in the generators to survive this pull or anything like that, but it does reduce your damage taken from any of the AoE damage. Just got to be careful because sometimes you'll be thinking you're safe because you're in the generator and then it'll despawn right as the damage comes out and you'll get killed. So do be careful of that. Uh, but yeah, that's this pull. And then we go into Machinist's Garden. Machinist's Garden is one of the more complicated in terms of like watching your feet fights there is in this expansion. Uh, you've got a lot going on with that. There's not too much besides just look at your your feet and don't get hit by stuff uh, on this fight, but I will explain all of the all of that that's here. So uh, the thing that this fight does, it kind of rotates between plants and lasers. Activate plant comes out early on, and you can see where that is. What you want to do is you want to... It'll target the closest person. If you're playing DK, what you want to do is stun it with Asphyxiate, and then when it comes out of that stun, it will again target the next closest person, which you want to be you, the tank, rather than some squishy ranged or, or DPS. So stun it, be the closest person, take the first hit is a good target, a good play for any tank that can do that. If you're a warrior, you can like stun it, like charge it, shockwave it, spell reflect the first shot of the next time, and, uh, and then it, you can spell reflect one shot from it, which is nice. Um, yeah, then other than that, you've got red swirlies to look out for. So the red swirlies don't start until after the first lasers come out of the middle and hit the hit a dead plant. Because when a plant dies, it starts spewing oil from where that plant died. As uh, so you can see where the old plant died, there's, there's some oil spewing out. When this plant dies, we'll have some more oil spewing out. And then when the hidden flame cannons come out of the middle of the room, when those hit the oil, they ignite and turn it into a lava volcano that will then start shooting fire uh, in that part of the room for the rest of the fight uh, so yeah you can see that's going on right now we've got fire in that where the where the plants were uh, so that area becomes especially dangerous and you want to fight away from that you've got more and more of these saw blades coming out the blue swirly especially with spirit bastion in your group you got to look out for the blue swirly as well that's a uh, that just comes from the boss and i feel like that's one of the ones that people most often miss on this fight because they're looking at all the other stuff uh, but yeah the discombobulator you got to watch out for that uh, and then you just keep repeating, but you've got more and more of these saw blades, more and more of the room is filled up with the fire, uh, and so it gets more and more difficult. In high keys, most of this stuff will be one-shots as well if it hits you, so yeah, really fun fight. Uh, I love playing and dodging it. Uh, I haven't haven't played it too much on DK before, but it's a, a very fun dungeon, in my opinion, for that purpose of uh, just kind of getting to, to have a bunch of stuff to dodge and... Uh, a couple of little mechanics as well other than that, but mostly you're just moving the boss around and dodging and not getting hit by any of this stuff. Uh, so there we go. And there's that achievement you get if you do dodge everything safely uh, on the fight. And now this area, you've got two spider tanks. Usually you do want to pull these together because they, they are nasty, but they don't do too much aside from this frontal sonic pulse that you do need to watch out for and dodge. It's not super well telegraphed. And these rockets that you also want to dodge or else they'll do a lot of damage to you. I've marked one of these with a skull. That was the one that spawns further up. The way it works is the that one is the one that actually controls when the taxi comes to start picking you up when the, the for the next place. So ideally, you want to kill skull about five or ten seconds before the other one if you're trying to super min max your time because that starts the RP for the taxi to come down uh, and pick you up. And then you can finish this off while that taxi is coming down. You can see the taxi coming down. Almost perfectly timed here. It's going to be clickable very soon here. If you kill them at the same time, you have to wait like 15 seconds uh, for the taxi to actually show up and pick you up. Uh, then we go to this last area of the dungeon with inspiring. This area is actually kind of annoying. Not the, uh, not the least annoying trash they've ever made. Uh, and so... You have the Defenders, the Tinkerers, and the Robots here. Since the Robots don't do too much damage with their short out anymore, it's not too bad to actually fight them with this first three-pack. Uh, but yeah, you want to you wanna watch out. You want to make sure you're standing in the generators. 
Uh, the generators are really good against the robots short out AoE that they do. Uh, we don't have one of those robots pulled yet, but if you were to pull the robots, you'd want generators here. So actually the pull that I'm doing, if we're going to pull the robots, we actually want to make sure that we still have defenders alive so that we are getting the uh, generators during this. That being said, again, it does feel like the short out is not anywhere near as lethal as it was in BFA, and it feels like you can live it reasonably safely without even needing your whole group in that shield generator. Uh, because, yeah, that generator is going to despawn here during this short out, and there's that, that squirrel in there, and there's a quake and everything. But, yeah, you can see the short out on plus 20. It is somewhat scary, but it's not... It's not going to, like, I don't even think it would kill people uh, if they were unhealed during the whole cast. It, maybe they would if they got no healing during the whole thing. Uh, but yeah, so we're going to fight these two robots without any shield generators, which was absolutely unthinkable during BFA. I, I If I remember correctly, maybe we were just doing way higher keys by the end of the season and, like, everything was more lethal. But that that I remember this short out being, like, a really scary thing. You can see, like, using a lot of cooldowns for it. To be fair, the healer is doing a reasonable amount of HPS uh, on the group here during this, so... It is some group damage, but it's not that bad. Now here we have reached 100% uh, trash count, so definitely could have skipped more earlier in the dungeon. Probably didn't need to back pull uh, the slimes like I did. Uh, because yeah, you can skip this trash pack here with Warlock Gateway up the side. Uh, if you do that, you usually want to Ring of Peace and Paralyze or Mind Soothe the closest mobs to where you're traveling. Because otherwise they might see you while you're taking the gateway. Uh, worst case, you just want to take the gateway from the far side of the pack. Or you can just run through and use a B-Res and skip that way. But honestly, this pack doesn't feel too bad anymore. One of the annoying mobs is actually a Dreadlord instead. Uh, now, Dreadlords are, of course, also annoying, especially given that they put sleep puddles in your personal shield generators. But again, the fact that the short out doesn't feel like a super one-shot anymore uh, is uh, goes a huge way towards making this, I think, a doable pull. Uh, so yeah, you can see, again, the short out. It's, it's going off here. We had somebody die to just getting hit by a squirrel. Uh, but it's not looking like too impossible to pull i mean it is a lot of damage it may be in a high keys you're still going to always want to skip this pack but i actually think that trying to skip it because the mobs have true sight in this pack uh is probably worse than just pulling it on in like pugs uh, so i'm going to start recommending that for most people i think uh, so once this pack is down you get to do the last boss king mechagon king mechagon actually Kind of easy on pull now that we don't have Awakened. It, this boss used to be one of the nastier ones on pull because it would come with a Awakened mini boss always. Uh, but now that it doesn't do that, it's actually one of the one of the easier phase ones of a boss fight. You kind of don't have too much going on. As I look at my group finder for an inexplicable reason, uh, this video this footage is just ripped from ripped from stream by the way, twitchtv ratnos If anybody's wondering where to watch these kind of keys, um, so. Yeah, you got to recalibrate. The moats do a lot of damage if you hit them, or if they hit you with the swirly, or if they hit you while they're moving. So the big thing about this fight is you generally want to play in such a way that you don't, you're not like between the moats. If you're between the moats, you'll have this spot where you have to do this complicated trigonometry to figure out where you're supposed to go. But if you just always position yourself so that all the moats are like on the same side of you, like the opposite of what I'm doing here, but it's not going to matter because the boss isn't going to do that recalibrate for a while. Uh, that makes your life a whole lot easier. So you, it, ideally, yeah, you want all the moats on the same side of you so that it's pretty easy to know where a swirly's moat is coming from, right? So like where I'm standing here, three moats are behind me, one moat's right there. I know all the moats are moving in that direction. I get hit by one anyways, uh, but that's that's the easiest way. And now again, you can see all the moats are in the same 180 degrees of me. They're all up in that top left uh, of the space here. Next time I see the, the swirlies, I know I can just move down and to the right and there's no moat that's going to come and cut me off. So that's the recommended way to deal with this. Again, uh, we've got another cutting beam here, and I'm going to look to end in a position where all the moats are on the same side of me, uh, and I have space to easily dodge. So I've kind of found that here. All the moats are on my character's right, uh, and so next time I see the swirlies, I can just move to the left and be safe. Or, eh, actually, the, the swirlies were going to the left, uh, so I looked at some of the arrows and instead moved towards the middle of the room, but uh, that you know is a little sketchy, so... You got to be careful of doing that. Uh, that's my that's my recommendation for kind of general philosophy with these modes. Giga Zap, you just need to make sure you don't hit somebody else with that shot. It's not going to kill anybody else in Phase 1 if you do, but it is in Phase 2. Uh, luckily, in Phase 2, it's very telegraphed where it's going to be. Whereas in Phase 1, you won't get that. You don't get that privilege, and whoever is getting targeted has to be really careful. Uh, so yeah, Phase 2 for melee, for tanks, 
Uh, again, you got to be really careful of getting hit by the blue swirlies, by the recalibrating things. It's really good to know where they're all coming from to make sure you're not going to be able to get hit by them. Uh, you can take like a little step back and then take steps forward. Uh, or you can just kind of, yeah, that, that's usually what I do is I like, I sometimes I'll be right at the very front. Sometimes I'll be further back and try and kind of keep the moats alternating between which of those spots they're in so that the other is safe. Uh, the Magneto Arm, this does more damage to you the closer you are to it, so you do want to run away from it. If you're a DK, you can use Death's Advance against this, but you don't need to. You doesn't. It just stops you from needing to hold W. I would recommend saving your Death's Advance for a panic moment if you're going to get hit by one of the things. Uh, now, you can AMS the Giga Zap and not get a debuff. You don't really need to do that because if you, you only get hit once by it unless you get cleaved by somebody else. But that's the main mechanic here is that it does three shots of Giga Zap, and if, if they cleave... Then somebody might get hit by two of the different ones, one targeting somebody else and one targeting them. And that will be lethal, so you do want to watch out for that. Uh, if you're a tank, you can actually live it, though. You're, if you're a tank, you can solo. If you're at least a blood DK, you can solo this boss from this point pretty reliably. Uh, but everybody else needs to be really careful and not get not get hit by multiple copies of, uh, of the Giga Zap. And yeah, of course, that's really hard when you have all these swirlies to dodge as well. So ideally, you want to be predictable. Where our melee are playing, you see we've got one melee right in the front right, one in the front left. And that way, they are kind of out of the way. They're going to be sending Giga Zaps off to the side, and the range can kind of send them down the middle. And that really makes it easier to handle that mechanic so that you don't get any Giga Zaps doing anything bad. You can see we've had a, a little pod tender coming out in the back there. A little bit of danger, but luckily, nobody getting killed. Once Pod Tender goes away next expansion, a lot of idiots are going to be on the floor again in M+. Uh, but not here. That's going to be the end of this particular boss fight. You just have to make sure you kill King Mechagon. Uh, and you get to collect your loot, which does not include the ring that I was hoping to see in this dungeon. Spoiler alert. Uh, but, you know, still not too bad. There's the, the Keystone Hero for the Mechagon teleport as well, because I already had a 20 Junkyard. Some gloves I didn't need. And yeah, that's uh, Operation Mechagon workshop. Hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you learned something from it. Uh, I will try to make ones about the Karazans, about Junkyard, about Grimrail Depot over the next week or so, uh, and maybe even do some, revisit the Tazaveshes now that we're in Shrouded. But for now, that's going to be the end of this video. Hit like, hit subscribe. Much appreciated if you can do that. That would really help me out. And see you in the next one. Bye.